I'm joined today by Paul Keckley, the managing editor of the Keckley Report and a widely renowned industry expert. Paul played an instrumental role in the passing of the ACA and has held leadership positions at multiple companies, including Ficor, Deloitte, and Navigant. In this episode of Tuning Healthcare, we talk about the ACA, primary care and how that needs to evolve, the evolution of alternative payment models, and the pace of transition from volume to value. Join Paul and me in Nashville as we tune healthcare. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for welcoming me to Nashville. Great to, to be with you uh, a couple of days before Thanksgiving. Um, so thanks for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. How'd you get into healthcare? Um, true story. When I was 11 years old, uh, I played golf at Brainerd Municipal Golf Course in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I made a birdie on a par three. And I told my father when I got home that I was going to be a professional golfer. And without missing a beat, he said, you'll have to be a doctor because they're the only ones that can afford to play golf. And back in that day, every Wednesday, the medical practices were closed because the doctors played golf. So I did the organic chemistry, the whole thing, because Dad said, if you're going to play golf, you have to be a doctor. So healthcare was natural. How many birdies have you had since? Maybe not one or two more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's one of those games that that can seem so simple but is so hard. It's frustrating. It's a great uh, mental game. It's a mental game. So ACA, you played an instrumental yep. role. Tell us a little bit about how you became so involved in the ACA and, and your role and and then move on a little bit to tell us about what 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 are you happy about with the ACA and, and what straight you? Uh I was kind of minding my own business in Washington. Uh, I was running the Deloitte Center for Health Solutions, which was their healthcare think tank. And I got a call uh, from Nancy Mendeparle, who said President Obama has just had a photo op with the heads of AMA, AHA, Advamed, Bio, Pharma, and AHA. I think I may have said that. Six big trade groups. And they've agreed they'll create a health reform package that's presented to Congress this year, and this was in 2009. Uh, now, the president's going to go uh, overseas in eight weeks, and they've agreed to collectively create that legislative package, and we need someone to facilitate that between the White House and these big trade groups uh, would you do it? And Nancy Ann, I had known through her time in Nashville. She's actually a graduate of the University of Tennessee. So I said, well, sure. Uh, so I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, the trade groups were um, very committed to solving the problems of everyone else at the table but their own. So everyone would say, here's a suggestion. We need to take cost out of the system by having the insurance companies standardize all their administrative processes and language and make it simpler for us to get paid. And the hospitals would say, uh, we are doing everything we can to take cost out of the system, but everybody else at this table isn't. So um, my job evolved to take all of the ideas, uh, evaluate them independently with a team of analysts and um, clinicians and actuaries, and come back and say, if you did this, 
then the result would be that. And we had uh, 54 ideas that kind of germinated from that process. Uh, many never saw the light of day because politically they were not uh, to one or more at the table something they were comfortable with. So can you imagine taking leftover TARP money? Remember when the automobile folks were bailed out? And we uh, essentially buy out at book value the excess beds in the healthcare system. And this is 2009. Pay book value to these Catholic orders uh, where you're operating hospitals where it's not necessary. We don't need the beds. At that point, we were operating uh, almost three beds per thousand. Uh, at that point, we needed about 2.2 beds per thousand based on demand. And now fast forward another 10 years out, we'll be at 1.1 bed. So it made sense. Why don't we take excess capacity out um, and redeploy those assets? Do you feel ACA has been successful at reducing excess capacity? No. Um, Why not? Two reasons. I, I think about this a lot. Nigel, this is something that uh, I literally lose sleep about. Um, it's highly politicized and not well understood. The combination of those two means people have uh, defined it in their own terms who've never read it. So the Affordable Care Act included a lot of things beyond uh, expanding insurance coverage through Medicaid expansion and healthcare.gov, uh, the marketplaces. You would only hear about insurance. But that uh, law, uh, Title V, for instance, was about let's create a whole new healthcare workforce that's technology enabled and uses data and op operates in teams and practice at the highest level of their training. You would not hear anything about that today. So I think the fact that it became highly politicized, um, especially among folks who'd never read it. And I think a second and related is it, it was branded as Obamacare. And that kind of drove this wedge between the folks that thought Barack Obama is the second coming or Barack Obama is the Antichrist. And it became shorthand for his administration instead of the concept of health system reform. And as a result, um, I think, ironically, we're back to saying maybe there are things in the Affordable Care Act that we should revisit the Republicans are actually beginning to say maybe there are parts of it that we could accept with some tweaks. But at that point, 2009, going to the 2012 uh, election, it became a political football. And I think that uh, disabled it. But it was passed. And as we look today, the systems um, that really and truly have taken beds out of the system. I was honored to have Neam Gandhi last week as a, in the last podcast as a, as a guest and Mount Sinai has taken a thousand beds out of the system, but there, there are very few systems like that. So, so why haven't they? Why, why are they not embracing uh, the opportunities that not just ACA, but, but, but a lot of the other uh, regulations and opportunities to move to value-based care that have been afforded to them, but yet, they seem slow. Well, it's, it's, it's a pretty complicated answer, but one, um, let's recognize that the system, uh, the incumbents do well financially in the fee-for-service model. Our system has operated on a market-up and pass-it-through business model, and it was growing at 2% above GDP year over year over year. So not surprisingly, 
who wants to change that? Um, the second issue was, so if we all say that the incentives need to change, who's going to be the one to decide what incentives are going to change? And one sector's income from that change is an operating loss to the other. So if you think about it, I mean, this is what I would hear um, in that two-year period. Um, you know, the insurance companies are all over value-based uh, models, value-based purchasing, because if they spend less on medical care, it's profit to the insurance company. And the hospitals would say, well, and that means you're driving operating losses on our P&L. So there was not a belief of a system reform. It defaulted to each sector had to define its own risk if we make this transition from volume to value. And what we tried to do in the law was um, integrate things that had been tried. What people don't recognize is um, in the seven different models of value-based care that are in the Affordable Care Act, all were cut and pasted from things we had done before. Um, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, Section 3022, uh, which is ACOs, was the physician group demonstration projects in years past when we had uh, kind of a dose of capitation. So nothing in the law that pushed from volume to value was a new concept. What was technically difficult is um, how much and how fast do you want to make that transition? And where do you start? Um, and where do you get the biggest bang for the buck? And that's a unresolved question today. So talking about the biggest bang for the buck, the latest government-sponsored primary care model, direct contracting, mm -hmm. just released um, a lot more information about it. What's your take? It excites you? Uh, for me personally, I think it's incredibly exciting because... So many health systems in particular have large populations of Medicare fee-for-service lives, yet this now creates an opportunity for them to, to truly manage them. It's, it's, well, I think we can all agree it's probably the most Absolutely. unmanaged population. So does it excite you as much as it excites me? Absolutely. I, I'm convinced um, <laughs> that the combination of the bundled payments and direct primary care will be the one-two punch that pushes the needle from volume to value. And the reason is employers and commercial populations will see that and they'll even expand it. So what Medicare does in most markets is um, introduce some things that may or may not work the first time. I mean, the uh, first time we did the ACOs, uh, when they came out, uh, we didn't get it right. And the success was not what folks would have liked. We're getting there. So I think what government has done, in spite of the politics of health care, is recognize that Medicare can lead. Um, and it has to because of the budget. I mean, we have a $947 billion deficit last year in the federal budget. And the easiest place for federal budget folks to address excess government spending is Medicare. They're not going to touch Social Security, and they're afraid to do much with Medicaid. But Medicare is something which everybody acknowledges could be improved. So what they have done is say Medicare will be the lab for this transition from volume to value. We'll try some things, and some are going to work and some are not going to work. And then we want employers and insurers to double down and expand that 
And that's why direct primary care and direct contracting is so uh, interesting because employers will jump on that. They think, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense because I can get to my workforce, even my healthy employees, uh, instead of just always addressing the big ticket items that end up in the hospital ED or uh, as an admission. So uh, it's going to be, um, regardless of the election, uh, this is what surprises people. Uh, healthcare as an industry is on a course that's very predictable right now. Uh, the, the past is not sustainable. The future requires that the incentives change. The future requires that we identify what constitutes value, that we embrace the notion that individuals who may be patients or enrollees or uh, your employees play a role in that and that if provider organizations have the tools and they have the incentives, they'll partner with these individuals to create value in the system. Uh, now the race is who's going to figure that out best? Who's going to execute well? So I agree with you. The value chain has left the station and you obviously played a big role in ACA, which is, as you said, was part of the Obama administration. Today, we have direct contracting coming out, which is obviously part of the Trump administration. And it's clear that the past is unacceptable and the future has to be based on value. Who loses in the future? Because you have payers who have certain entrenched ways of doing business. You have provider systems, right? And the, and the employer and the, and the employee, right? Those are really the four yep. people that pay for healthcare. Uh, let's put the government to the side for a second, outside of the government. But of those commercial institutions, the, the employer, the payer, the provider system and the beneficiary, who wins and who loses? Because surely everybody can't win. No. Um, the employer is likely to be the near-term winner because our ways of directing care in the commercial population uh, clearly point toward, toward excess utilization of hospitals and unnecessary diagnostic tests uh, where uh, individuals in tandem with a primary care team, not necessarily a primary care doctor, a primary care team can actually reduce demand in the system. And then in the supply, it's a rationalizing game. So bigger systems that are fully integrated that have the ability to offer a plan, not just hospital beds and outpatient services, will be at an advantage. And those that choose to be uh, simply, we're an inpatient, outpatient entity, uh, they've got a hard time ahead. Um, if you were to make bets on the winners and losers, scale wins. You can't play in this environment with um, Google and Ascension saying we're going to commingle data uh, or Haven with Amazon, JPM, and Berkshire with a million lives in that data set. That says you've got to have data, you've got to have technology, you've got to have process, and that says you've got to have capital. So if you don't have capital to achieve scale and acquire technology, you're probably odd man out. Um, the interesting wrinkle in this is how much private equity is stepping into that to provide that capital and that technology to, to a lot of these folks. So um, private equities investments in medical groups, uh, over 300 deals in the past two years, rolling up groups like dermatology, virology, ortho, because they want to equip them with the tools to manage risk, to manage value, and not 
simply become an employee of a health system. So um, I don't think it's a matter of which sector is the winner or loser. There are winners and losers in every sector. And the winners in those sectors have the technology, have the scale, have access to capital. They've got leaders that see a future where they're paid for a result instead of volume. They are looking at individuals. They're not looking at patients. And they're looking at ways of treating that go beyond a pill or a test. They're looking at food as medicine or behavior modification. Uh, primary care, that's physical and behavioral health, prophylactic dentistry, ophthalmic care, it's pharmacy, it's nutrition, and it's um, a coach that's telling you how to change your behavior. That's an exciting future for healthcare, and that's what we're headed to. So the ones that kind of embrace that in those sectors will be a winner and the ones that have their you know head in the sand and think we're going to somehow go back to the way it was i think they're odd man out so i agree with you for the most part one of the things that i find perhaps most frustrating uh, being out in the market and talking to a lot of a lot of health systems today is the failure of the payer to be truly collaborative time after time I'm talking to a health system CEO and she says, I want to move faster down the path to value, but my payer's not collaborative, not willing to share enough of the value. So we as Lumaris often bring a collaborative payer to the market to help solve that problem. Do you see a, a future where the payers will become collaborative or do you think they're going to continue on this path of, of trying to dominate the, the local market and do as much as they can hmm. to really not truly be collaborative with the, with the providers in the market? Well, just as there's no um, uh, cookie-cutter health system, there's no cookie-cutter health plan. So I deal with a lot of them. Um, some are exactly as you describe, their way or the highway. Um, Others view their role as being um, the engine inside a provider organization to allow it to take risk and bring the capabilities um, that are missing. But um, if you look at this from a, uh, an investor perspective, the core business in the health insurance portfolio is decreasingly profitable. Taking risk on a group is decreasingly profitable. So it puts groups like Cigna in a unique position because they've primarily been an ASO operator. They're not taking a lot of group risk, some, but they buy an express scripts. So I'd say um, if you pick the right payer, and if the terms of that agreement are both based on a shared level of risk, transparency about the data, um, medical management that's collaborative, then you've got a good payer to partner with. I see both. I see places where health systems have joint ventures with health plans that have never been collaborative where the system can't even get access to its own data and they've got a, uh, an exclusive agreement with them for 15 years. So that's just stupid. Let's talk about another topic that I know is uh, near and dear to your heart and, and also to mine, which is accountable primary care. Lumaris has pioneered the nine C's, which is truly about how do we transform primary care and make them... Uh, a truly accountable quarterback of healthcare. You've written many times in the Keckley Report about what's fundamental about primary care. Where do you see us in the journey of the transformation of primary care? Um, I think we're 
we're in a stalled mode right now. Um, here's why. Um, primary care clinicians um, are at the, at the low end of the totem pole still when it comes to access to capital. When it comes to uh, income, their overhead is still higher than any other. And when most traditional health systems are thinking about their physician strategies, um, they're not looking at primary care as the centerpiece of that. They still think of it as a peripheral part. And they think, well, maybe we'll do an ACO and maybe we'll have some primary care docs at the table. But it has not been central to the way uh, most of the health systems have thought about their future. There are exceptions. Um, but not surprisingly, what's interesting about what um, folks like Goldman Sachs are doing with Privia and other uh, investments, you're, you're reading about Ioras and one chin meds and all the, the models that have an outside investor who says the front door of the system is primary care. It's not confined to an internist, a pediatrician, a family physician seeing 30 patients a day. It's a management process. It's multidisciplinary. It's digital. It's physical and behavioral. Uh, they're way out ahead. So I, I see some pretty exciting models, but I also see the politic in most communities where it's not quite as developed as it should be. Um, and I think that's simply the local politic. Most hospitals are still dependent on their specialist. Uh, most hospital CEOs are evaluated based on their financial performance, their P&L, their balance sheet, and their solvency and sustainability and things like that. And a lot of that really uh, is directly related to how satisfied the specialists are. So um, I think the system needs a jolt. I love this direct primary care, direct contracting uh, that CMS is doing. So I think alternative payments uh, coming out of the last four years of the Obama administration with the Affordable Care Act and then into Trump's first four years have really gotten a toehold. I don't think they're, we're, we're going back. Um, that will separate winners and losers. And primary care, not surprisingly, is where uh, Larry Merlot justifies to his investors, CEO of uh, CVS, by saying, well, guess what? We're going to be America's front door. It's primary care. And purchases Aetna to achieve that end. So that's back to your question of, some payers versus other payers. There's a view that uh, the role health insurance plays is transitional, and it'll be integrated into a delivery system of health that may be offered by CVS, or it may be offered by I uh, totally agree Jefferson with that. or Centera or whoever, yep. and we'll be competing that way. If I were a payer today, I would be concerned that my brand will meet up to their brand. So if I'm going to go to, if I'm going to have to deal with an insurance company w that carries the health system brand, it's likely to win nine times out of 10. And so if I was advising a pair today, I would say figure out how to collaborate quicker rather than slower, because otherwise you will find the health system is putting its own brand in the market. Yeah. And people trust the providers more than they trust the plans. Uh, we know that. Yes. So, have you ever called your plan when you had a sore throat? Yeah, but uh, they also don't necessarily think the uh, plans are going to tell you what's best for you. They think plans may be too money-oriented, or they make money by denying care. So, that, again, is sector by sector. You can kind of pick out the winners and the losers by sector and look at the signals they're sending operationally, kind of strategically, 
how they're addressing their capital sources. Um, and I, I think primary care will, primary care is the future of the system as its foundation. As a primary care, you need to manage the entire panel and you need to manage them across the life cycle. Uh, what do you think is, um, as you think about the different models out there for transforming primary care, do you, do you agree with me that a holistic approach is, is truly where we have to aim towards and there might be others along the way? Or do you look at it differently and say, you know, I'm more comfortable with different niche players and, and so be it? No, I'm, uh, I've modeled um, basically kind of three models on a continuum of the status quo of primary care, which is largely defined by access to MDs and DOs that do physical medicine, up to a very holistic model where uh, behavioral health, nutrition, uh, food insecurity, homelessness, all of those factors are integrated in, and then this kind of middle where you've got some of that but not all of that. Um, I think we are necessarily going to this holistic model. Uh, because it's the only way to reduce demand. If we leave this current model in place, then uh, four out of five in the population that don't have a regular relationship routinely with a primary care provider are going to find the emergency room or anything goes. And I don't think that solves the problem. So, um, again... Where, where is capital making its bet? It's making a bet over here on holistic. It's saying advanced practice nurses and nutritionists bring a lot of value to primary care. It's not just, you know, MDs and DOs. So yeah. It's fascinating to watch. When, I, when we hit uh, December, right, which, which we're in, and we, we think the year has ended, and I always think that, the cycle of healthcare starts for me in January with the JP Morgan conference yeah. and the amount of capital that you now see looking to invest in healthcare at JP Morgan last year compared to five years ago and 10 years ago is, is absolutely incredible. And yeah. there's $2 trillion of fresh capital at the disposal of private equity right now. Uh, tech, Financial services and healthcare are the targets. We fare well when compared to financial services. So, because of the fluctuation of currencies and things. Uh, so, that investor says now within that world, where is the opportunity for a 20% CAGR, a 2% management fee? And I can flip this asset, this is the average, 4.7 years. That's their hold period. So private equity is looking for quick hits that it can flip to move on and deploy its capital elsewhere. Healthcare's got a lot of that. Just think about this, Nigel. If, if I got really serious uh, in primary care about your problem with anxiety, which influences your weight and your... Um, type 2 diabetes, you can't solve that problem in one year. But we know from the literature, if you really manage it aggressively in two to three years, you can bend that curve big time. So you can't do it in one year. And that's why I like this notion of direct contracting in primary care. If we put those primaries at risk and we create a holistic model and manage your health, and you come up part of that solution instead of just a user. Um, I think we're going to see some cool stuff. I think we see a bend of the cost curve that's substantial. And I think private equity already sees it. Paul, we're going to come back here year after year and, and measure the progress. Yep. Before I end, I'd like to end with uh, what I call a few quick fire questions. Um, Medicare Advantage for all or Medicare for all? Medicare Advantage. Favorite golf course you've played in the world? Probably Harbor Town, Hilton Head. Best piece of business advice you were ever given? Um, invest in management. 
If you had a hundred million to invest in healthcare now, where would you place it? Um, at risk primary care. And finally, if you could change anything in healthcare, what would it be? Ignorance. Paul, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite streamer, whether that be iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. You can also check out numeros.com for more information. This is Nigel Orenstein with Tuning Healthcare.